there had been many rumors of a shooting that was supposed to take place today. All these rumors had me on edge all day and I was still fidgeting in my seat even though I knew it would be fine and nothing would happen. It was lunchtime when the school shooting was supposed to happen and that's where I find myself right now. All I can think about is that a school shooting would be such a terrible thing. I see a kid open his backpack and maybe it's him. Maybe it's the kids standing in the lunch line right now. Or the shady kids hanging out at the back of the cafeteria. I'm just sitting there, zoning out, and thinking about all the possible things that could happen. Then, somebody yells, He has a gun! There's silence. And then panic screams fill the air as bullets shred through the air. It's such a terrible thing. The principal is shot and bleeding out. The school police officers has had his kneecaps blown out. The multiple other administrators are laying dead on the ground, along with many students. There are screams and gunshots filling the air along with the scent of blood. So many screams, so much blood, such a terrible thing. My hand slips and I blink a few times, realizing I was just daydreaming and nothing had happened. A school shooting would be such a terrible thing, is what I think as I stand up, pulling a gun out of my jacket. Such a terrible thing. The night is an ocean in which every star in the universe is but an island. The ocean's waves lap over the earth on a 24-hour cycle. Its tides roll in and roll out at a rate of once per year. And the ocean carries things in its depths, things you would not believe. Every so often, something meant for deeper waters finds itself beached here. We mistake them for unhappy dreams because we cannot process their reality. Usually they suffocate in daylight, thrashing in their death throes and expiring in a paroxysm of terror. That, at least, we can feel. Some, lucky or unlucky, depending on your perspective, find refuge in what puddles of earthly night they can find. Basements, closets, the depths of the forest, the space under your bed. Children are aware of them, though their parents are not. Children have not learned what is impossible. In the dark places of the world, they may persist for years or centuries, every so often going abroad with the setting of the sun, every so often ensnaring a victim. How many stories have you heard of demons and vampires, ghosts and monsters, phantoms and hags, and things that go bump in the night. Each one is a fable, and yet each one contains some true feature of that which lurks in the dark. Our brains cannot process them, nor our eyes see without light, and so we fill in the details. Our mythologies give them form, and those forms change over time. Once a troll, then a devil, now a black-eyed child. Many are the masks of nightmares. Their shapes and names evolve to fit our fashions, but they themselves remain ever the same. How many times have you seen a shadow out of the corner of your eye? One that was not there when you turned to look? How many times have you lain paralyzed in bed, certain that something was with you in the room? And how many times have you awoken from a nightmare Unable to convince yourself that it wasn't real. It was real. It's always real. Every nightmare you've ever had, every half-remembered terror of your childhood, every razor-toothed, snarling-jawed, dead-eyed thing that has ever haunted your dreams is real. And it is your fortune that most of the time, most of the time, they are just passing by. They can afford to be patient. For the night is ancient. The night was already ancient long before the first day. 
and a billion years before the first terrestrial life writhed out of the primordial ooze. It was already there, watching. Out of its trillion, trillion eye, out of its trillion eyes, the knights saw our ancestors descend from the trees. When early humans first harnessed fire, it stood just outside of the warm circle of light, waiting. And when we built our cities, wired them up with electric light, and declared that we had won our final victory over the darkness, the night smiled silently in its infinitude. For the night will still be here when our cities crumble, when the last street lamp goes dead, when the last star in heaven burns down to a cold ember. The night will win. The islands of light will each sink in their turn beneath the ocean. And when that time comes, when that dark ocean drowns the world, the night's victorious children will run rampant, gorging themselves with abandon. And it is then, and only then, that we will see the true face of nightmares. I was driving home late one summer evening. It was dark and everyone was in their beds. My eyelids felt heavy as I struggled to pay attention to my driving on the dark and empty country road. I knew this road so well, I probably could drive home with my eyes closed. It didn't sound like a bad idea as I sleepily nodded. Before I knew it, my eyes were closed and I was asleep for a couple seconds, before jerking my head back up and shifting my body in the seat. I rolled down my window and let the cool air blast into my face. I was almost home, just needed to focus on my driving a little longer, then I can collapse into my soft bed. Focus. Focus. I opened my eyes. I must have fallen asleep again. I noticed something in the middle of the road ahead, but I was still waking up and it didn't even cross my mind yet that I should slow down. It happened so fast. My eyes widened as I saw a deer, a doe, that glowed white in the headlights. But something was strange. It was bounding right towards me. Adrenaline suddenly shot through my body and I felt numb. I swerved my vehicle in hopes of evading a collision with this maniac animal. Split seconds seemed like minutes. I heard a thump as I sideswiped the deer, but managed to get back on the right side of the road and looked in the rearview mirror. I swear. I heard a woman's blood-curdling scream. The deer was still running straight forward, but somehow its neck was completely twisted around, as if broken, and it was looking at me still, its mouth gaped open. It disappeared into the darkness behind me, along with the screaming. I woke up in my bed, the sun peeking in the windows behind the curtains. Was that a dream? It must have been. My body still felt shaky and paralyzed from the nightmare, and I was soaked in sweat. After laying there for a while, reviewing the strange dream in my head, I finally had the ability to move again, and I rolled over to look out the window beside my bed. The white deer was staring at me with pinkish, red, soulless eyes. It screamed. It was the biggest mistake of my life. I was just a teen and my mood swung back and forth from time to time. Of course, I never really meant what I said, but I let my emotions spill out, something we all do every now and then. This time though, my stupid actions caused me to have to pay the price. I had just come home from a date with the hottest chick in my school. We got caught up, if you will. And in my lust, I forgot that curfew was at 10 sharp. Well, I walked through my front door at 10.45, and that didn't make my mom very happy. She gave me a lecture and I did my best to tune her out. I really did. My anger got the best of me though, and in my rage, I said aloud, 
I wish I had a different mom. One who wasn't such a psycho bitch. My mom just stared at me with her mouth wide open. I figured this was my chance to slip up the stairs and go to my room before I got my ass beat. I took off all but my boxers and slipped into my sheets. I tried to lay there thinking about the awesome sex I just had, but I couldn't help but feel guilty about saying that to my mom. I got up out of my bed and started to leave my room when I ran into my mom in the doorway. My lights were off and I couldn't make out her face, but I knew it was her because there was no one else it could have been. Mom, I'm so- I began, but my mom just put a surprisingly cold finger on my lips. She bent over and kissed me on my forehead, then walked down the stairs to her room. Figuring I was forgiven, I walked back to my bed and laid down to sleep. When I awoke, I could smell the delicious smell of bacon. My stomach rumbled, and I hurriedly went down the stairs to the kitchen. I saw my mother with her back towards me, leaning over the stove, cooking a meal. Good morning, I said, but my mother just ignored me. I thought she forgave me, but but whatever reason, she wasn't talking to me. Good morning, I said, this time a little bit frustrated. She just kept cooking. The sound of sizzling bacon was the only sound in the house. My anger swelled in me like a giant balloon, and it was going to pop. Mom, I said... She turned around, and I thought I was going to throw up. She was pale and had blood stains all over her apron. She was a lot taller and thinner, and her fingertips were a bluish gray. This was not what scared me, though. What scared me is that that thing wasn't my mom, but it had my mother's face sewn onto its head like a mask. The thing began to open what used to be my mother's mouth with the most sickening grin across my mother's peeled off face. Good morning. Back in the 1980s, there was a phone prank that my sisters and I used to do when we were kids. It was known around the neighborhood that if you were to dial your own phone number, replace the first three digits with 555, and then press the receiver down three times, the phone would ring back on its own. It had to be on a touch tone, which were common back then. We did the prank whenever we were bored, waiting to see our mother or father reach for the phone, only to hear nobody on the other end. This sent us into huge laughs, until one afternoon our mother yelled at us to stop messing with the phone. I remember this vividly because after she answered the phone, I saw her face drain of color as she looked over at my sister and me. Her reaction upon slamming the phone down scared us, and we promised never to play with the phone again. We must have done the prank a dozen times up to that point. The last time I attempted the phone prank was at a friend's house across the street during a sleepover. I picked up his phone and dialed 555-4127. I clicked the receiver down three times before I realized I just put my phone number after 555 and not my friend's. Before I have a chance to do it over again, the phone rings and I pick it up for my friend, thinking it was a legit phone call. He answers. Hello? I can hear someone screaming back. What did I tell you? You're fucking dead! My friend started crying and was so terrified and confused that his mother sent us all home. The thought of the phone as a dangerous thing suddenly became real. Later on that night, while I'm looking at my friend through the window, I see a man come up behind him. The light shut off. It may have been his father, I, I wasn't sure. The next morning I called across the street and got a busy signal. I walked over and knocked. Nobody came to the door. All of the cars were in the driveway though. He should still be home. I walked around to the back of the house to see the back door wide open. I can see that they are in the living room watching TV. I enter the house. A voice is heard softly in the background. If you'd like to make a call, 
Please hang up and dial again. When I made my way to the living room, I saw my friend and his parents, all sitting on the couch staring through me with horrible purple expressions on their faces. Phone cords wrapped tightly around all of their necks. They tore the house down. Nobody would move in there. I asked my mother years later, looking at the empty lot across the street, about the phone call that made her yell at us that one day. And she told me all she could hear was a man screaming in a very deep voice. Something about tracing the call next time someone called this number. It sounded like a recording with all of the static. But she wasn't sure. He sits in his room with a raw throat and bloody knuckles. It can't be undone. It can't be erased. His girlfriend's corpse lies in his arms, severely disfigured and mangled. The man is in shock and doesn't know whether to cry or laugh. He feels nothing emotional, just newly exposed blood running down his arms and legs. Amid his seemingly desolate state, he remembers the box in his pocket and begins to laugh. Everyone knew how much this couple loved each other. David had plans for months for this day. David and his soulmate had been inseparable for the past two years. It seemed no matter what situation arose, they would always find a way to be in it together. Their love could not be matched by anyone else. It was supposed to be the day he proposed to her. He had called for her to come over to his house, where he had a nice candlelit dinner planned out. He had rigged the electricity in the house to suddenly turn on every light and appliance, then seemingly die out, much like a power surge. I regret to inform you, listener, that this didn't happen the way it was supposed to. Merely one light turned on in the kitchen, flickering above the new laptop David had received as a present a few months prior for his birthday. Sitting atop of this gift was a webcam David had obtained for a few dollars from a friend at work who simply claimed he didn't want it any longer. Each time the light flickered, David looked back at the laptop. His senses were doling and sweat was pouring from every pore it could. After some time, he couldn't bring his gaze away from the laptop. It wasn't long until worried yells from his girlfriend started to blur into ambient sound. He no longer sensed anything. David snapped. Something caused him to do this, but we will never know for sure. Maybe there was a faint whispering in his ear. Maybe he saw an unfamiliar face. Or maybe it was something far more sinister. No matter how you want to put it, he snapped. Before his girlfriend could utter another word, she was knocked out cold. David threw punches as he screamed like a madman that couldn't be stopped, never once questioning his actions. This brings us to where we are now in the story. The effect of some sort of delusion had started to wear off. As David rolled off of his dearly beloved's soaked body and dragged her into his room so he could still stay with her for the duration of the night. Outside of the house, all is silent. David takes this in for a split second, but not a moment longer. His brain has become metaphorically dead, as if his mind was asleep, but his body was not. He laughs and laughs and laughs until he closes his eyes along with his girlfriend. Our research has shown that 100% of all people exposed to our project, entitled The Webcam Project, have acted in the same way, or nearly the same, as David did. We are now able to take over nearly anyone. Anyone that has a webcam cannot avoid us. We're always watching through that webcam they have plugged in. That's what they told me. The lowly interns swore into secrecy. I don't know how they do it, or why, but this is my warning to you. Unplug your webcam, and never plug it back in. I know I did. I no longer work at the agency, and they might come after me for posting this. But it's for the best, right?
alone. You never have thought of the concept alone before. But as you are in bed, unable to sleep, your mind starts to wander. You think about what you did or what you are going to do tomorrow. Then you start to think of darker subjects, subjects you wish you had never thought of. You wonder if you are the only one of the house awake at this hour. You wonder if you are the only one awake in your room. Right there, you hear small and subtle creaks in your kitchen. Right away, you pass it off as just the wind. But then, you hear it again. This time, you know it can't be. I mean, just a second ago, there was no wind, but a breeze. Maybe you're imagining it. Yeah, it has to be that. I mean, no one else is awake, and you're certain you locked the door. Minutes seem like hours, and you hear the creak again. But this time, it seems closer. How could it? Your imagination and mind are playing tricks. I mean, you live in a good neighborhood. There's never any crime here. Your thoughts are cut off mid-sentence as you hear the noise, which seems to be just outside your door. Without hesitation, you throw your heavy comforter over your head to protect you. You're breaking out in a cold sweat, thinking over and over again, there's nothing there. Then, you hear the small, somewhat non-existent creak of your door. The sound rips through your mind for what seems like hours. You want to check, but if you do, you can meet face to face with someone or something. So you just shut your eyes as tight as you can, trying as hard as you can to just go to sleep, just leave this nightmare. Hours go by without a single noise. Your heartbeat is slowing down. You start to think how stupid you were to think something was there. As you lift your covers off, you freeze and just hear one last thing. You should be up. Hey there guys, this is Master DK. Thank you so much for watching tonight's video. If you like what you hear and you want to hear more, feel free to explore my channel and hit subscribe if you wish. You can also follow me on Twitter and Facebook for updates, and uh, also consider visiting my Patreon and uh, financially supporting this channel. I have uh, several rewards waiting for people who do so. Any amount that you're willing to give is huge to me, and I'll be very grateful. Thank you guys once again, and have a safe night.